Carl, in a couple of sentences, what is CRISPR and why are scientists so excited about it? This is like totally unfair because I like wrote thousands of words on the subject not that long ago, but I'll try to restrict it. So CRISPR is, stands for something that I can't even remember right now. The, the acronym is ugly and not worth knowing, but basically what it is is gene editing that's cheap and powerful. Um, people have been manipulating genes for um, 40, 50 years directly, um, but it's been very crude. Um, sometimes, you know, you can move, trying to move a gene from one species to another. Uh, CRISPR uh, came out of, uh, actually it was discovered in bacteria. It was basically a way for bacteria to chop up DNA as kind of an immune system against viruses, and then people harnessed it to basically chop out a very specific piece of DNA and um, replace it with something else. And then you can do very fine editing with it. Uh, and it's really only the past couple of years that it's come about, and it's cheap, and it's easy, and uh, like I said, and, and that's its promise and kind of its, I guess, its danger. So that's... Is it is it a kind of technology that you can do in your kitchen? Is the kind of technology you can do in your kitchen? Um, there, I, I've seen some Kickstarter campaigns for little CRISPR kits, um, but as, if I understand it correctly, that's pretty basic stuff. It's like, um, hey, use CRISPR to put this gene into some E. coli and it will glow. You know, you're not going to destroy the world with glowing E. coli. Um, right. I mean, it, it, when recombinant DNA first came along in the mid-1970s, uh, it was, you could only use it in restricted environments, you know, P1, P2, P3, P4 facilities, where P4 was the kind of facility in which they do research on chemical and biological warfare, Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, and nowadays, uh, most recombinant DNA is uh, in high school labs. Yeah, there's these contests uh, iGEM, you know, where like the kids get together and they try to just use recombinant DNA to do something cool, like make E. coli smell like spearmint or bananas or something like that. And yeah, it's it's a it's a science fair thing now. Um, CRISPR CRISPR isn't quite there yet, but I don't see why it wouldn't be. Um, I mean, I, it's interesting actually talking to scientists about it because uh, they'll say like, you know just in their work. I mean, the, the scientists are not trying to like change life as we know it, but you know, they just want to like study what some gene does. And so they'll put a, uh, they, they, they want to like create a mouse with a, with a slightly changed gene just to see what happens. Uh, and it could take a year to, um, to like, to, to, to engineer a mouse and to actually like see if that mouse line was really going to work and you, you could use it. And now it's just, I mean, you almost sort of virtually kind of mail away for it. I mean, it's just, it's, it just, th there's this whole step in science that has just suddenly shrunk down because of CRISPR. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, right. it's, it's a very powerful technology and probably unprecedented, I think. And the ability gives human beings to intervene in the gene, not only their own genome, but the genome of every living species on the planet. Yeah, that's the other thing, is that some of these gene editing techniques, they would work really well in some species or some group of species, like, oh, you can use this in bacteria that, that have some way of trading genes with each other, and that's it. Um, or you can, well, use, I mean, you can use it in mammals, but in right. CRISPR, it's like nobody has found anything where it doesn't work. But just to give you uh, one final uh, point here, and then we'll move on, uh, the, it used to be that... Uh, you could isolate genes and then in order to insert them in uh, another organism's genome, you had to insert the gene into a viral vector, which would then carry the gene into the genome. But you had no control over where it would go right. uh, or whether it would function, that is express itself, uh, or mess up the genome. Yep. What's really remarkable about CRISPR is that it enables you to do gene insertion with a precision that's unprecedented, exquisite precision. All right. So I let's, have, let's turn to some other I things. have the next question, which is, what is your greatest concern with how CRISPR might be used? Okay, I confess I thought about this a little bit uh, ahead of time. 
uh, my greatest concern is not that we're going to have a new eugenics movement. Every time we have a new kind of uh, genetic technology or understanding that comes along, people say, ah, we're going to have a new eugenics movement. And, and we should point out, you are a scholar of eugenics movements. Right. You, you know read, eugenics movements. I know the eugenics movement. I wrote a whole book on it. So um, I don't want to give you a history lesson, but I want to characterize uh, what eugenics meant as a, a movement that flourished from the late 19th century through the 1930s or into the 1950s, depending on which scholar you read. But uh, you can differentiate be, uh, between a public eugenics and a private eugenics. Public eugenics meant that you would use genetic information and also the ability to manipulate genes so that you would improve the overall quality of what people used to call, or, or currently used to call the population, or in more neutral terms now called uh, the, the genome, or, or I mean the, the, um, um, the germplasm, okay, of the, of the entire uh, population. So, so like all of humanity. Well, like all of humanity, right. Uh, and the idea was that uh, you would use this information and technology so that, I say public because you're concerned with the whole, gene, uh, with the whole population, and number one. And number two, you would use public institutions to coerce people uh, in order to, uh, make, to, to move down this line. So uh, in the heyday of the eugenics movement, um, we had in this country, we pioneered sterilization laws uh, in uh, many states of the Union. And these laws were upheld by in the United States Supreme Court by a vote of eight to one, and the decision was handed down by the leading progressive justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. And the idea was that, uh, that uh, bad folks in society who constitute alcoholics, uh, prostitutes, criminals, and so on, and the mentally ill, uh, were uh, behaved that way or were characterized that way by virtue of their genes. And so by sterilizing them, we would then prevent the genes from being transmitted to the next generation, and therefore the quality of the population would steadily improve. The other side of it, and this is commonly called negative eugenics, the other side of it was a positive eugenics, so that if we know about genes and we can uh, see what kind of people have good traits, uh, then we can encourage those people to reproduce, okay, uh, in greater numbers. Uh, the trouble was that uh, nobody understood uh, what the genetic basis was of uh, traits that people admired, uh, such as uh, musical ability, uh, scholarship, link writing, etc. Uh, and uh, no one uh, really knew how to encourage people, let alone coerce them to have more children, the good people. So the, the most practical um, uh, technologies that were proposed or methods that were proposed uh, came from a future Nobel laureate in this country named Herman Muller was that in order to pursue positive eugenics you would find great men. He spoke of Einstein for example or Sun Yat-sen, uh, people like that uh, and you would have them inseminate thousands of women okay <laughs> and that the women would, I mean Muller said in a book called Out of the Night published in 1935 just imagine the women lining up in order to have themselves inseminated and their, their wombs would be the vessels for uh, the, 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 the genetic improvement of the race. Well, of course, he was crazy uh, in that regard. So and it shows so, a Nobel Prize right. doesn't necessarily guarantee sanity. Ex exactly, right. exactly. Okay. Not, in, not in social engineering. So those are, the, that, those are the two kinds of public eugenics. And I don't think that we're going to see anything like that either one of those uh, in, uh, as a result of CRISPR. We Why are, not? Well, that's a good question. And with regard to sterilizing people or preventing people from reproducing, we have too many laws now. The, the, the Buck v. Bell was 1927. That's almost 100 years ago. Supreme Court case the where Supreme a woman Court sterilized. case. We have many Supreme Court cases. That, that, that decision has never been directly overturned, but it has been eroded uh, on all sides and underneath so that you could never get a court in the United States to say that someone must be sterilized. No. United States. In the United States, right. What about well, you know, could, China, India, you could, like whatever that's right. other we, places? We do have a global society now, and so I'm, I'm speaking mainly about the United States. You, I'm glad you correct me there. 
uh, who knows what might happen in dictatorships, for example. It's hard to imagine that these things happening, this kind of thing happening in a democracy where individual rights uh, are, uh, have any standing. On the other side, of course, uh, positive eugenics, well, it's difficult to see uh, women doing what Herman Muller suggested that they would be willing to do. So if we're going to improve the quality of the race, we have to get lots of people to agree to do it, lots of, lots of couples. Uh, and I don't think people uh, uh, make reproductive decisions in order to improve the quality of the population or the gene pool. They do it to satisfy themselves, at least in my experience. So uh, I don't think that either one of those is going to happen. Where we do have to be concerned, however, is what has been in the, in the prospect of what you can call, has been called a private eugenics. Private eugenics. Okay, where as individual couples or reproducing units, uh, we seek to uh, edit the germline, so to speak, so that we can have uh, superior people or healthier people or healthier children or what have you, or children who will uh, be better able to throw a ball through a hoop at 30 feet or whatever. Why we go to the next one? Okay. What specifically can we do right now to re-engineer humans? That's a natural segue. <laughs> yeah, there you go. What can we do right now? Okay, well, what right now to re-engineer humans? Well, I mean, I guess this sort of gets to the issue of what we mean by engineering, um, because um, you know, like, I, I sometimes we I think you know CRISPR has this allure of being um, something totally new. You know, you're changing genes. Uh, and I mean, if you've ever, you know, had almonds or tomatoes, I mean, you are eating, I don't know, genetic engineering. I mean, like if you've seen the wild relatives of almonds or, I mean, if you ate the but wild that, relatives of almonds, you But that's by conventional get, breeding. Conventional, sure, it's conventional breeding, but, what, but then what's happening at the level of, genetic, uh, of the genes? What's happening is that you're saying like, well, there are certain there there are certain genetic variants that I like, uh, that I'm gonna that I'm going to uh, combine and I'm going to promote, and I'm going to basically, ch I, I'm you know by breeding you're gen you're reconfiguring the genome of a plant or a dog or what have you. I mean you know it's it's you may not know the names of the genes you're playing with, but I mean you can look at the genome of a dog and look at the genome of a wolf or a coyote yeah, and you right. can see that you know we have massively changed their genomes and we've changed those genomes for specific things that we wanted like a wolf that won't kill us you know and well, <laughs> things yeah, like that that lick our hands you know? and lick our hands yeah that, i mean it's that that's not you know you don't teach a dog to do that that's in their dna um and so i mean i i uh so you know the things so i i, I don't know i mean the so the things that we can do right now to quote unquote engineer human DNA is say, um, I want to have children with this person instead of that person. I mean, you're making a choice. Now you're, you're using a proxy of, of, their, of what they look like, what they, what they, how they strike you and so on. I mean, we're not yet at the point where you're inspecting their genome and you know, although that's probably gonna happen pretty soon. Mm -hmm, I mean, could. I heard yeah. in Iceland, there's some app where you can like, you know, if you're with someone in a bar, mm -hmm. you can make sure that you don't, aren't <laughs> gonna be carriers because there's such a small population. Uh, that's, you know, that, that's not right, that far but, in the future. But when, you know, people get together uh, to reproduce, they're basically engaging in a lottery. Nobody knows how it's all going to turn out. Um, Except, okay, yeah. what about in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation Right, that's, that's exactly good for you. That's exactly where I was going to go with this. Because, I'll let you take it from there. All right, well, uh, you can now re-engineer in the following sense. So in vitro fertilization is a uh, commonplace technology that's used largely by couples who are otherwise infertile that have children. So, uh, and by the way, um, uh, we should bear in mind that uh, a long time ago, a brilliant geneticist and eugenicist named J.B.S. Haldane uh, wrote a book called Daedalus. It was published in 1924 in Britain, in which he basically argued that we could in the future expect to have uh, test tube babies. 
Uh, he was very farsighted in that way, and IVF is a form of that. And he said, of course, people will resist that, but what was, what was uh, un inadmissible in our uh, biological lives yesterday becomes admissible today. So in the beginning of, of uh, artificial insemination by donor, for example, people assumed, uh, held that kind of technology to be a form of adultery. Uh, surrogacy was greeted with very mixed uh, reviews. Uh, when it came along in the 1970s, and in vitro fertilization was charged with being a new form of eugenics. But are, these are now commonplace, uh, uh, commonplace technologies used in our reproductive lives as a society. And you can imagine that, and we have, the, I think, the technology to do this now, uh, having um, several uh, eggs fertilized in a petri dish uh, with sperm, and then if the uh, family is at risk for a hereditary disease, such as Huntington's, uh, to do a genetic analysis of the embryo and then not engineer, okay, in the sense of change the embryo, but simply select the embryo that doesn't have the bad gene. Okay, that's a form of re-engineering in the family. Yeah, that is engineering. That I is mean, engineering, it's, just right? To, just because it's a, a just because it's a variation that our bodies kind of you know produce doesn't mean we can sort of say like oh it's and it's natural you know we're saying like okay we're going to take the variation that we generate and we're going to make choices we're going to say like you know I'd that's rather right. not use that egg that is going to lead to, you know, that has a, a ca cancer, you know, uh, gene, for example, um, that might lead to like just almost a certainty of very early cancers. And there are people who will do screening right now, I mean, regularly to say like, nope, we're not going to use that one, we're going to use that one. And as soon as you're making those choices, I think you're totally engineering. Well, I agree. I'm saying that okay. this is a form of engineering. It, we're already, it's already upon us. And we, uh, exercise this kind of engineering even beyond the petri dish uh, when we uh, do amniocentesis and then abort uh, fetuses that are diagnosed for say having um, three 20 number 21 chromosomes which gives rise to down syndrome hi i mean how much is that would you say how much does that tie into what you're describing as negative eugenics uh i don't think of it as a negative eugenics um, because we're not trying to improve the race, so to speak, or the population. We're only trying to allow people to have healthy children. All right. I don't think, I think it's important to keep those distinct, those two ideas. Ooh, this is a good question. How can today's biotech industry learn from the heyday of eugenics? Ah. Well, because the, one, one the, the, the biotech industry is, is getting into CRISPR in a big way now. That's correct. That's correct. And, and the evidence of that is that there is a huge dispute going on of international proportions, not to mention transcontinental proportions in this country, over who owns, who's going to get the patent rights to, CRISPR. to the CRISPR technology. Yeah. That's an issue we could turn to a little while. But uh, it seems to me unquestionable that there is going to be a very, very powerful uh, uh, impulse coming from the biotechnology industry to use this technology uh, for some kind of enhancement or improvement, uh, uh, not necessarily f to be transmitted in the germline. Let's be clear that there are two kinds of ways you can use the CRISPR technology. One is as the kind we, the way we've been discussing, which is to say to change the genome, your genome, in the germline that will be transmitted to the next generation. The other one, however, which is much more likely to come sooner rather than later, is to intervene in the genomes in, in organs that are diseased in your body, say the kidney or the liver or the lung, where cystic fibrosis, for example, uh, expresses itself. Uh, or some, any, any organ that may subject, is sub, uh, subjected to some kind of uh, uh, oncogenic insult from cancer genes. So uh, those kinds of interventions would not be transmitted to the next generation. The only ones that get transmitted are those that intervene in your sex cells uh, or intervene in the, in the embryo, or, uh, et cetera, in a, in a dish. So we have to keep those two things separate. I think that the biotech industry is going to be a very, very powerful force in bringing about that second kind, namely the 
uh, intervention of uh, using CRISPR technology in disease genes uh, that don't get transmitted to the next generation. At the same time, I can imagine biotech companies uh, developing this technology in ways that might be uh, uh, effective in changing the genome down the germline. Uh, and I think that they will probably seek to get it approved. Uh, they'll have to be, they'll have to go through all sorts of, uh, jump through all sorts of hoop with the Food and Drug Administration because anything that changes the chemistry of the body is in, a, in the sense of a drug, uh, not pot, so for example, but sense of a drug uh, is uh, subject to FDA approval and regulation. So there is that, there is that safeguard. But I can imagine them bringing to bear uh, pressure on FDA, which they have been known to do in the past. But I think another part of it that we could talk about at some point here is that uh, the, the success of the biotech industry depends not only on the its own technical prowess and the new technologies and medicines it produces, but also on consumer demand, mm -hmm. okay? And since 1986, drug companies have been able to advertise directly to consumers. That's by an act of Congress. And we see these ads on, an, on TV all the time, right? I mean, they're sort of frightening. Don't, the, the, the descriptions of the dangerous side effects seem to take longer than the descriptions <laughs> of the advantages. But nevertheless, they're there, and they do generate consumer demand. So when we talk about biotech in regard to CRISPR, I think we have to talk about it symbiotically in relationship to consumer demand. Can you, I mean, I can see it now. The ads for CRISPRing your baby. Right. Oh my gosh, you can see it, right? Like, you know, this beautiful, perfect baby kind of drifting into view on a cloud. Or, you right, know. And, the, and the adult child playing the, the, the you know, the right. violin and right. or right. the concerto and the Caution, piano. Caution, side effects might include thousands of years of torment and, you know, I, it's going to be, I don't know. Do you think that we'll be seeing those? Well, I mean, first of all, this is utopian. Uh, <laughs> no, I know, in, but in, I'm but talking about like just in, the in, ads. In, yeah, I know. I, sure, I can see the ads. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in, in order to provide those, you I mean, to mount those kinds of ads, you have to have command of the technology and the knowledge that enables you to say, if your baby has these genes, your baby is going to debut at Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. at the age of 17, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody has the slightest idea what genes contribute to those kinds of talents, let alone many other talents that we all uh, uh, value uh, and admire. So there is huge technology, I mean, huge scientific barriers to that kind of thing coming along anytime soon. So, uh, in my view. Yeah. No, I agree. But I, and I think maybe it'll be more sort of like uh, people with a particular, um, you know, hereditary diseases. That's I'm actually correct. thinking, I mean, you, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, sort of how CRISPR might be used now and, uh, you know, say to, you know, to fix cystic fibrosis. You know, somebody has cystic fibrosis, it's the result of a faulty gene and just CRISPR it and fix it. Um, and this is sort of, this seems like it's going to like uh, finally achieve the dream of gene therapy, which people have been talking about for 40, right. 50 years. And, you know, right now, like the conventional gene therapy that doesn't use CRISPR, it's, it's getting on the market and um, they want to charge like a million dollars a pop. So can, so the, can you imagine like how much the, the biotech will want to charge to say like, we're going to fix hemophilia and you and all of your descendants just for like 50 million bucks, because it'll be worth it. Like think about if you were to, you know, think of all of the cost of taking care of you with hemophilia and all your descendants, it's yeah. gonna be enormous. Right. If $50 million, it's a bargain. Yeah, and we have precedent for that. Uh, we have to go on another question, but okay. we have precedent for that in, uh, you know, all of the, the way some drug companies are behaving these days in regard to the prices they charge. Sure. For, like Gilead with Hep C. Uh, you right, know, and that's tens just, of thousands right, of dollars. Right, that's just a conventional thing. I mean, exactly. gene therapy, they okay. actually literally, someone wants to charge a million okay. dollars to Here, fix Here's a question disorder. that is uh, a natural extension of what we've been okay. saying. So, what are the technological limits of human enhancement? How will those limits shift in, the, in 10, 20 to 50 years? Uh, the technological limits of, of enhancement um, are huge. 
I mean, as we've been saying, huge. Yeah. yeah, I think I think the problem is that like we we're, we're sort of extrap. It's easy to extrapolate about what we know about cert certain genetic disorders to all of what it takes to be a human being. You know, so um, you know if if you had a particular form of hemophilia. We'd know exactly which gene was causing you the problem, which wasn't letting you clot your blood. And in theory, we'd know exactly how to fix it. It's like, we got to go in, fix the factor, factor 10 gene or what have you, and then you'll be fine. And that's it. Done. Yeah. But as you say, like, what are, what are, the, what are the genes that are for, you know, going to Carnegie Hall? Like, pff, who knows? Yeah. I mean, I might be a little more sanguine than you are about how soon we're going to figure out some of these complex traits because it's i mean you know there there are big studies going on now you know uh you know with you know tens hundreds of thousands of people and they really are zeroing in on certain genes that do contribute to some of these these traits and and they include these hot button issues like intelligence um you know and, and there and there are you know, a complex trait like um, like obesity is a, is, a, is a complex trait. And, uh, you know, some people have, there's one variant that on average adds seven pounds to people. Mm -hmm. Like we know that one. Um, and so, you know, you, it, to me, it doesn't seem like that big of a stretch to, um, to, well, see, to see, like, go, using CRISPR not just to fix one gene, but to go in and, and fix well, a few different places in DNA and actually make a big difference going towards some of these goals. I think that could happen. Well, that could. Uh, CRISPR, I mean, many of the traits that we admire or like to have are, are polygenic. That is, the, the products of many genes, including disease traits, for example. Uh, schizophrenia, for example, is a wonderful article in the current New Yorker by Siddhartha Mukherjee on uh, his family where schizophrenia is uh, more <coughs> expresses itself more frequently than in the normal population uh, uh, and the one of the signs that he, he cites is identified you know 10 12 so many genes behind that so maybe CRISPR will enable you ultimately to fix all of those genes at the same time I, I don't know but that's what would, would be required what seems to me of uh, uh, also here of interest and relevant is what do we mean by enhancement? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so right now it's you know, they're 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 sort of uh, sharply salient traits uh, that uh, We would all agree qualify as enhancement making ourselves or our children more intelligent than we are better at the pitching a softball uh, or you know doing what doing uh, playing a musical instrument or writing something uh, we can all think of those things, or maybe even being um, a better businessman than some people we know um, uh, who are prominent these days. And uh, so, uh, but then there there are other other definitions of enhancement that you can think of. Uh, what might qualify as enhancement today might be um, uh, held to be uh, essential tomorrow. That is, your ability to uh, manipulate a computer. For example, uh, I know people who are not very adept at it. They just throw up their hands sooner or later. But maybe we, we could say, well, in today, tomorrow's world, uh, the ability to manipulate a computer will be as essential as the ability to use language uh, in the ordinary sense. And so we might say, well, this is required. Now, will people want to make take advantage of these things if we know how to do it? Uh, I think they will because, uh, you know, people, we are all in the game of enhancement already. I, I mean, not everybody in this room, but uh, uh, as a society, uh, we um, uh, try to find better schools for our kids, right? Uh, we, well, you know, we, we, we manipulate the environment so that the outcomes are better than they would be otherwise. We administer uh, uh, drugs to right. our kids, like growth hormone. Right, where well, growth hormone isn't necessarily needed. Oh, okay. Well, that's right? a hot button we thing. We do but all no, those what things. About, okay, but what about vaccination? You know, vaccination. Yeah. So, like, you know, in Boston, 1721, smallpox epidemic hits, and and there's a doctor who wants to inoculate people, and peop and and there are riots. You know, like people are just furious about this, and they're saying it's unnatural. It's it's God's will that, that we have smallpox and we suffer through sure. it. 
And today we'd be like, of course, I'm, well, I mean, well, hopefully yeah. most people will say like, I, you well, know, I'm going to give my kid a smallpox vaccine. We right. don't have smallpox now because of vaccines. Right. So, you But know, that's exactly Haldane's point. You see, that when biological innovations initially come along, often they are met with resistance and outrage. Right. And riots, in this case. And riots. And then, as people, the people more or less tame them. So take... take um, artificial insemination by don or in vitro fertilization, all right? That was widely attacked as inevitably leading to a new eugenics where you could manipulate <coughs> the embryo. But what did people do? Well, they took this technology and they put it in the hands of the medical community, which is where it originated, by the way, uh, and they used it not to enhance people, but to uh, or improve them, but simply to enable people who would otherwise be unable to have children to have them. All right. I think it's my turn. Your turn. Yeah. Okay. What are the limits we should be putting on scientific research into human genetic enhancement? And a, there's a second question here. Do you think that there should be an international moratorium on editing germline cells? I think that... There is de facto an international moratorium on editing germline cells. Do you it think doesn't there mean, should be? Yeah, I understand. Should. I understand. The, the word should. <laughs> you got to take a stand. Well, I think that there should be. I mean, I was at this conference at the National Academy of Sciences in early December. It drew four, 400 scientists from around the world on, on uh, CRISPR. And a major uh, topic uh, of discussion. And these were a lot of distinguished scientists, including uh, some of the CRISPR originators. Uh, major topic of discussion was precisely human germline editing. Every single person, or I won't say every, almost every single person there said it should not be done now. Why is that? Because nobody knows any way to make it, ensure that it's safe now, okay? I would say that, so there ought to be a germ, a, 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 an international moratorium on the technology so long as it is not demonstrated to be unsafe, okay? At the same time, I would keep the door open to the possibility of human germline editing should the time come when it can be done safely and efficaciously. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's not because I'm a... Uh, 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 a barn-burning eugenicist here, uh, it's because it seems to me that you don't know, can't know really ahead of time what benefits might come from new technologies or how you need to regulate them. Without knowing the technology, you can't regulate it effectively. For example, there was a lot of talk in the 1930s that sooner or later people would, physicists would learn how to release nuclear energy, the energy locked in the atom. With it, they could drive steamships across the Atlantic with the energy in a cup of water, uh, or they could ex destroy cities and things like that. If you had tried to regulate nuclear technology, I mean, the release of nuclear energy in 1930s, you would have missed everything that enables people to, to extract the energy from the atom. You wouldn't have known about fission. You wouldn't have known about the essential requirement of having fissionable natural fuels, such as uranium, uh, et cetera. So you would have made a whole bunch of regulations that would have been completely irrelevant uh, come the discovery of fission in 19, the end of 1938. It seems to me not so dramatically similar, but somewhat similar, that the, to try to see ahead as to what the technologies will be, what the knowledge will be, what benefits might accrue from using human germline editing and bar them categorically without knowing them, it seems to be a mistake. Do you think um, that th there's an issue with uh, the, the heredity involved? So like if we're trying to decide, is, 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 here's this technology, is it safe, okay? You know, if, if we're talking about sort of gene therapy to fix someone's hemophilia, we're just saying like, if we give this gene therapy to this one person, is it like on average safe or can we like or will we accept the potential side effects on the individuals who we give it to? Yeah, or are they any worse than just treating the hemophiliac as we treat them now? Right. 
But it's like, obviously, like, you know, the drug sort of, or the treatment ends with the patient. And here with germline engineering, it's like the, the, the treatment potentially goes, just goes on forever because you have to think about, well, what are the potential side effects in their descendants? And, I mean, does the well, FDA even know how to think about that? Well, maybe not. But that you never know until you have, you try it. You try it in mice, for example. I mean, when you, in, in, uh, in the testing of drugs, I mean, the testing of this kind of technology for safety and efficacy will be done in exactly the way that drug, new drugs are tested. They're tested in laboratory animals. Uh, mice being our closest cousins in this regard, uh, or rats. Uh, and uh, they will have to see, they'll have to have long range clinical analyses of what happens if you genetically engineer uh, a mouse so that no longer has the gene for Huntington's or no longer has an oncogene. All right. Okay, so your turn. <laughs> Is a cancer moonshot possible? What can we learn from past government moonshots? Ah. I'm not sure what CRISPR, that has to do with CRISPR, but I'm perfectly well, happy to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so the cancer moonshot is, um, is uh, this, this um, initiative that Obama has announced um, where they're going to um, basically um, uh, try to sort of take a lot of the, the most uh, innovative uh, uh, kinds of research on cancer and really push them hard to, to, to try to get some, some serious advances in the treatment of cancer. Um, and uh, it's, I, I, it's, a, it's kind of an odd thing, I have to say. I mean, be, I, I wrote about this for STAT, and um, it's interesting that Obama has, you know, he, Obama, I mean, I think part of his legacy will be several very big science projects. There's this Cancer Moonshot, Personalized Medicine, the Brain Initiative, things like that. Like there is a, there is a you know, there is a, Obama does have a, does think seriously about science. Um, but, I mean, he is working in a sort of, you know, this environment, which is very different than in earlier uh, periods of history. I mean, to just invoke the moonshot is really tricky because like, basically like what they're saying is that what they'd like is about a billion dollars to uh, use, you know, to, to, to invest in some of these new technologies, some of which may involve CRISPR. You know, yeah, you could basically yeah. sort of... I was teasing about that. Oh, yeah. No, there is a CRISPR hook here. Like, you'd basically pull out your immune cells, CRISPR them, so basically program them so that they will recognize your cancer cells, put them back in you, and then they just destroy your tumor. That's the idea. Um, that's, you know, one of several ideas that's, that's going on well, right now. I, I, I thought it was a very bad idea. That you think yeah, it's a bad idea? Announce, the announce it as a moonshot. The difference between trying to figure out and do something about cancer and sending a man to the moon is that in 1961, when Kennedy announced the, moon, the Apollo program, we knew how to do it. It was a matter of engineering our way to yep. the end, but we right. knew exactly how to do it. We knew the laws of physics that were required. We knew the problem of getting uh, people in orbit. Uh, we knew the energy requirements. We knew how to build the rockets. Uh, we had to develop you know, gu guidance systems, et cetera, but we knew how to do it, and it, and we had the uh, uh, manufacturing capacity, the engineering capacity, the technical knowledge, uh, or the ability to learn what we needed to know. That was all there, okay? Uh, at the same, when you look at the cancer, it is a very, very complicated disease. It is not one disease. It is many diseases uh, in the sense that uh, there are cancers of different organs. There are different kinds of cancers. Uh, the genetics of it is not well understood at all. And throwing money at it is not a bad idea, but it has to be thrown, I mean, invested in the research in a way that is uh, uh, plausible in the dividends it will return, okay? So uh, I think that intensifying the degree of investment in our understanding of and seeking uh, clinical, uh, I mean, better understanding of and clinical treatments of cancer is a good idea. At the same time, we have to understand about cancer that 
We are in a long running war with the disease and that we, in, in 1900, uh, a very distinguished uh, physician here in New York, whom we would call nowadays an oncologist said, reviewing what people knew about cancer is it said the fact of the matter is that today what we know about cancer is virtually nothing why it happened etc and then we can say we could say 100 years later in 2000 let alone even more so in 2015 we can say we know a great deal about cancer it's taken us 115 years to get there and we're going to be able to say in the year 2000 2100 that we know a great deal more. So we are in the position of investing, not necessarily to save our lives or even the lives of our children, but to save the lives of our descendants down the road. This is an act of faith, okay? This is an act of, uh, of commitment, of vision for the future, and oh, good for Obama for um, reaffirming the necessity of investing in that project I okay think but to call it a moonshot raises expectations yeah. that are counterproductive yeah and i mean cancer you know there have been expectations raised in the past the war on cancer that nixon right. declared and you know we we learned a few things out of the war on cancer we learned to we certain learned certain genes that our genes came out of the war genes which are but linked not, to cancer. Not, not the way it was originally intended right exactly exactly on the other hand um, I mean, I, I, it's hard not to, to read some of the new studies on cancer treatments and feel like things are really taking off. I mean, cancer immunotherapy and some of these other techniques, they're, they're actually really exciting compared to sort of the medieval techniques that we've used in previous decades. Well, I hope you're right. I've heard it before. Uh, and so that makes me skeptical in, in coming at this from my sort of historian's long and skeptical perspective. But uh, as I say, I think we're going to know more. I think we're going to be able to treat more cancers and so on. But I also think that cancers are uh, inherently part of life. Yes, yes, we're we're multicellular, so we're kind of stuck with them. That's I, right. I agree, but <laughs> but I but I you know I think but maybe we'll cancer will be like a manageable thing that people like. Oh that yeah, people in some cases it with. is. In some cases, just keep it at bay or or you know knock it out here and there. Not like having a cold, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> if you could change humanity in one way, what would you change? <laughs> wow. <laughs> You've seen all the way that people have talked about wanting to change humanity, you know, all the dreams of eugenicists. I would get rid of tribalism. Oh. That's off the top of my head. But okay. I think getting rid of tribalism, which seems to be some kind of sociobiological, genetically programmed trait sure. in, in uh, not only in human beings, but also in other animals, uh, would be great because well, I don't have to rehearse for uh, this audience. Uh, uh, the uh, vicious, savage downsides of tribalism as they express themselves in the world today. Uh, we only had to look at Belgium a few days ago to be reminded of it. Uh, so there is something, I think, genetic in this propensity on the part of human beings because we see it in so many other uh, social animals. So oh. that's what I would get rid of. <laughs> But what would you lose when you, as you engineered humanity not to be tribal? Well, there might be I, some I like things. to think that I could still be, you know, love my wife, love my children, love my friends, love new friends, love all of you, uh, without your, we're, any sense that we're tribally connected, except that we're all human beings in this, all in this together. I don't think we would lose necessarily that much. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what would you get rid of? What would I get rid of? Uh, <laughs> Turn the question around. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, 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 no. That's good. That's good. What would I get rid of? Um, ooh. Um, I would, I would just get rid of all the super rare diseases. You know, like all, just all these diseases that, like, you know, are just strike a few people and make their lives miserable. And it would be just, it would be easy to, to take care mm -hmm. of, you know? 
And I mean, and there, and there would be no side effects, you know, because these are just like relatively rare mutations. And, 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 you know, I do think if you got rid of tribalism, you, I just, I just, I just envision like just a bunch of sort of like uh, zombies who just don't really care about anything in particular. I think there's like a, I think, I think there's just like, you know, part, you know, uh, Zombies, uh, because <laughs> no, 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 I, no. I do. I, 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 we. I, I, you know. I think you're right that that you know tribalism is very is is probably you know there is probably a genetic component to it uh, because of sort of you know maybe it's you know what evolutionary biologists call group selection. Right. You know exactly. And that's good for sort of like making groups work well together, but you know like just like ant colonies will go to war with each other. Like, you know, like if you have a group and you identify with the group and work well with your group. Well, what about the- And then there's that other group over there. Yeah, what about the us and them problem, you see? That's my point, that's yeah. my point. It's like, I mean, if we're just like, hey, there's no, there's no us and them, maybe we'd become incredibly disorganized. I, you right. know, like maybe we couldn't run a society, I don't know. Well, to, to, to go to uh, uh, the, uh, the extreme here. Yeah. Uh, what, would, what, what would you think about getting rid of whatever it is a genetic that causes us to die? Whatever's genetic that causes us to die. Uh, there, well, ye, buh, yeah, but the problem is that's that's called DNA. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like you know, we we we're, well, we, we can reprogram ourselves. Yes, no, 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 it's true. Anyway, the, the red card is up here, so it's up, my but, time. But I will <laughs> on say, happy I, note. I will say, I will say, there are you know, there are a lot of studies going on right now on people who live re a really long time, and they're starting to find the genes that they share in common, and you know, who wouldn't want to give that to their kids? You know, mm -hmm. the longevity genes. Come on. Right, the Methuselah gene. Yep. Right. But remember what Methuselah says in, uh, you know, what, uh, who is it in, um, no. uh, in Gershwin? You know, uh, Methuselah in 900 years, what, what's the use of living when no gal will give in <laughs> to no guy who's 900 years? Yeah. So here's the question. How do we prepare for ethical issues of discoveries not yet made? How would we have prepared for CRISPR? How would we have prepared for CRISPR? Yeah, uh, that's a good question because, like, I, I sort of, I don't know what you think, but I sort of feel like, I mean, CRISPR sort of exploded and everyone's saying, like, what do we do? And, and yet I feel like, you know, historically, like, we've dealt with the same things over and over again. Right, so first learn history. Yeah, learn history. <laughs> yeah, right. Read Dan's books. I mean, like, really, because it's like, I mean, in a way, there's a lot, I don't know what you think, but I feel like there's a lot of deja vu here. You know, people are like, oh my gosh, like all these things are happening and this is really scary, but we've sort of been through this before. And, you know, maybe that's comforting or maybe that should be disturbing, you know, but we can at least look at the times we've dealt with these things before. We're common in DNA, for example, you know? Um, I, I mean, I don't know if you think that there are particular lessons that people can take to like think about the ethical issues with CRISPR now. I mean. Well, I mean, the, the, the new ethical issues raised by CRISPR, it seems to me, or, or let me put it this way, that, that old ethical issues have been made more concrete by CRISPR. Because so, people- So it was hypothetical before, was very and now hypoth it's really gonna happen. Very hypothetical mm -hmm. before in the case of recombinant DNA. Uh, and now, I mean, we have a kind of confluence of technologies here. The, Recombinant DNA has become CRISPR technology. Uh, uh, in um, uh, selective breeding in, among human beings, uh, as the Nazis tried to do it, uh, has become in vitro fertilization. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have a combination, a confluence of technologies that make the concrete realization of these prospects much more probable and reachable. So then that makes the not the ethical issues new though they have to be connected to the technologies that would enable them which is then to say that however we choose to regulate this technology must be tied to how we can use it mm. all right so uh, it goes back to the nuclear model that i suggested mm -hmm. uh, earlier that so you would want to be looking at 
in vitro fertilization, you would want to be looking at what kind of actual changes were made uh, in, uh, uh, in the genome, et cetera. You'd want to look at safety, you'd want to look at efficacy and so on. But you know, there's another element here uh, that we haven't discussed, uh, except only tangentially. And that is, uh, and the tangential part is the biotech industry and the very powerful economic incentives that it introduces into the use of this technology. The, the part that we haven't talked about directly, uh, we ought to spend, a, we could profitably spend a few minutes on, is the medical industry. Because none of these, uh, no, no form of CRISPR technology is going to be realized, used, uh, made available, except in, it seems to me in a medical context. I can't imagine that we're going to have independent uh, walk-in CRISPR clinics, you know, uh, on 8th Street or here on Broadway. <laughs> Uh, where people can just go in and, and uh, have their fetuses' genes enhanced. This is going to be a medical procedure that will have to be carried out uh, in a medical context. And that then tells us that we need to think about the, equi the equity in the access to medical care, right? All of these technologies having to do with genetic diagnosis, genetic therapy, and now CRISPR enhancement, uh, can, it seems to me, not be separated from the ethical issues of how we organize and manage the availability of medical care. I don't think we have that much control, and I'm thinking about stem cells. So right now, there are the, all these like stem cell clinics all over the place that are just on the fringes of the medical world. They're not really regulated. They're here in the United States, they're in China, they're in other places. Right. They're making all sorts of promises. People are going there right. and spending tens of thousands right. of dollars for stem right. cell well, treatments. I, I, think, I think you will have walk-in clinics for CRISPR. I think you will. I mean, IVF clinics right now, like they're not, they're kind of you know, well, controlled. That's, that's by true, medical but industry. you know, here, here's- they'll, they'll add on a CRISPR but, option right. but while may, you're here. In this country, yeah, well, maybe you're right. Heaven help us, but, uh, <laughs> but here's a reason why IVF clinics and stem cell clinics uh, are operate the way they do outside of the regulatory regime of government, and that is because under federal law, you no federal money can be spent on anything having to do with the manipulation of embryos. Okay, mm. so stem cells is like that falls under that category. IBF definitely falls under that category. And as a result, the only regulatory laws we have are state laws where uh, stem cells and IVF, et cetera, are brought under state regulation. But because of the anti-abortion movement and the right to life movement, uh, going back to the 1970s was something called the Hyde Amendment after Congressman Hyde of Illinois, uh, who was a, a very uh, profound social conservative, uh, no federal money can be spent for any of these purposes. And without that kind of expenditure, the reach of the federal government, then uh, the federal government cannot reach into these private clinics. So that the only place that we had, have had recombinant DNA regulation, for example, is under research done with money from the National Institutes of Health. Mm -hmm. All right. So since the National Institutes of Health are proscribed from... Uh, uh, supporting this kind of work, uh, they are also, uh, uh, they, they cannot reach to uh, anything that's outside. Interesting. So we, what we have to do is to change the, uh, the scope of uh, admissible federal regulation, it seems mm -hmm. to me. I think it's my turn. Yep. Okay. All right. What would it take for people to understand a scientific issue, to understand the scientific issues well enough for a democracy to craft good policy? Well, you know, this is a, a problem that pervades uh, all of science policy making uh, in the United States uh, and probably elsewhere in the world. Uh, and that is, uh, how do you uh, arrange things in our society through the distribution of power so that uh, at least inform, not necessarily right, but inform decisions concerning is, uh, uh, matters uh, that rest heavily on science can be made. And there it seems to me that 
what you have to do is you cannot do it by direct democracy. You can't do it on the Internet. You can't do it by Twitter because all you get with that is distortion, uh, misinformation, uh, and uh, probably some degree of demagoguery. Uh, the, what, you, what we need to do is to make sure that through the regular instruments of government that we now have, uh, the courts, the Congress, and certainly the presidency, uh, that the, those bodies of government, branches of government, are, have, act, have available to them adequately informed and reasonably balanced uh, groups of advisors all right, uh, that can then explain these issues because nobody can keep up with them all, all the time. No congressman can do that. Um, and uh, I just don't see any way around that, that, uh, uh, that there, you must have the scientific expertise, but you don't want to turn power over to scientists, okay, who are unelected, unaccountable, mm -hmm. et cetera. So they have to be in an advisory capacity. Uh, this is a major issue in the courts these days. How do you get judges who will be scientifically informed well enough so that they don't make uh, technically stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can make stupid decisions for other reasons, but they don't make technically stupid decisions. So I, I think that's a, a serious problem. The more science pervades not only you know, our reproductive lives and our medical lives, but everything we do. Well, and especially with the CRISPR, like, as we said, it's moving so fast that, I mean, I could see within a few years there would be a lot of things ready to roll with it. And I doubt that Congress or, you know, federal regulatory agencies would be really ready to say like, okay, we've got our policy worked out. Um, yeah, I mean, there, this thing didn't even is, exist yeah. two years ago. Right, right. It's hard to believe that will, that'll happen. You're doubtful. Right. Yeah. So here's the last one. You want us to do the last one? Uh, we're actually at the time for questions. Oh, okay, okay fine. Who should decide what is permitted? You guys. <laughs>